Welcome to Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your partnership in the Research America Alliance. If your organization is not a member, please, please join us. My colleague, Anna Platt, would be happy to connect with you. And her email is in the chat. And she hopes that you will get in touch so she can share the benefits of membership with you. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Dario Gill, the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at IBM. Dario is responsible for IBM Research, one of the world's largest corporate research labs. And he is a globally recognized leader in quantum computing, which is the subject of today's talk. He's also a leader within the broader science community, including serving as a member of the National Science Board. And we have the very good fortune of working with him, both as a member of the Research America Board and also on the Science Technology Action Committee. So as always, please type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will pose as many as possible during the Q&A portion. So Dario, I'm now gonna turn it over to you. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And uh, I just wanna thank all, all the participants of today's call and members of the audience. To, uh, that want to share a few minutes to discuss where what is quantum computing and where it's going. And then uh, I'll be delighted to, uh, to have a dialogue through questions. I think the first thing I would like to say is that this is not just another incremental piece of technology. Um, and, and as a result of that, it's, it's good to put it in a historical moment that this is the kind of equivalent to what we saw in the 1940s with the advent of the first computer. You're seeing here a picture of the kinds of systems uh, that were built in, uh, then, you know, during the Second World War, um, that were used in the context of doing things like decryption, right, and you know, and calculating trajectories and things of the sort. And of course, it was the very beginning of of the computing revolution that we've all benefit uh, benefited from for for many decades. And I'm showing a picture of two of our uh, researchers, and he Park, uh, in uh, in our Yorktown Research Laboratory in New York. And, um, and in the 2010s, what we're starting to see is the emergence of a new form of computers uh, called quantum computers. And, and so I think it is interesting to see the historical parallels. And, and the reason why this is important is that, in fact, the category of computing itself is going to branch. And it's not every day that the macro category, I don't mean like that you have another generation of iPhones or an another generation of microprocessors or another generation uh, of supercomputers, but that the category that defines the entire field moving forward will have a branch and we will refer to as all the computers we've ever kind of built in the past and the ones we use everyday life as classical computers. And then there'll be this new branch called quantum computers. And, and that's quite fundamental. So, so, so statement number one is that quantum computing is not just another step in Moore's law. It's not just another better and faster computer. It is actually something fundamentally different. And why do we care about this? And, and I'll describe uh, a bit you know, what they look like and what they do. We care about this because uh, you know, in our world, we face a number of problems that have the characteristic that they have an exponential number of variables present in them. And, and to be able to tackle them, it would be incredibly powerful to tackle these exponential problems with exponential computation. So if you actually look from an information theory perspective and divide the classes of problems that we try to address with computers uh, you know, in, a, in a taxonomy, you would you know, have a class called easy problems in quote, where the number of variables is not exponential. And uh, you know, lots of mathematical calculations that we do in everyday life from playing video games and all sorts of things, uh, you know, rendering of images, those are non-exponential problems. Um, now there's other problems, you know, a larger circle that have the characteristic that the number of variables that one has to compute over is exponential. Famously, examples in chemistry and, um, and materials in general modeling the physical world has the characteristic that if you want to model it with extraordinary accuracy, they're exponential because in the end, you actually have to look at the interactions of electrons and electron orbitals with one another as they form molecules and then more complex structures. 
and that those interactions grow exponentially with the number of electrons present or electron orbitals present. There's also problems in mathematics, like optimization, uh, that can have um, you know, an exponential characteristics, and problems like factoring that are the basis of encryption uh, and, the, and, and the way we encrypt uh, all digital communications have the characteristics that the reverse of encryption, decryption, is an exponentially hard problem if you have if you're doing things like factoring of prime numbers. And then simulating quantum mechanics. We know that our world obeys the laws of quantum physics. And anytime we make an attempt to simulate quantum mechanics, it is an extraordinarily hard problem uh, for classical computers. So enter quantum computers. The idea is to build machines that obey the laws of quantum mechanics, that exploit quantum mechanics natively to be able to perform calculations fundamentally different. It is a totally different mode of computation. I like to joke that not even the bit is sacred. We, we didn't even preserve the idea that in the end is zeros and ones, right, the digital world. So, so the fundamental unit uh, of information in this world is something known as the qubit, uh, short for quantum bit. And what we do is we're gonna represent information exploiting principles of physics namely superposition, interference, and entanglement, which I'm not going to go today to describe. I've given other talks that you can find on YouTube to learn more about it. But what I want to talk about, that the reason it is important, is because there will be a class of applications ranging from, as I was describing, simulated nature, problems in physics and chemistry and material science, and over time, the life sciences, problems that of data that has structure that will have implications for machine learning and ranking in groups and factoring, and the bottom line is that there are classes of problems that would take, you know, basically an infinite amount of time to compute in a classical computers that would be possible to do in a question of hours or days with this new advent of, of computers. So let's look for a minute of what they look like and, you know, how you program them. And then we'll talk about what, what are some examples of what you can do with them. So um, left hand side again. Right, programming a quantum, a classical computer in 1946 looked like the picture on the left. You literally had to plug and you know and turn on dials to send the signals into, into the machine. And programming a quantum computer in 2015 looked like the picture on the right. That's Jerry Chow, uh, you know, controlling um, these uh, you know external uh, signal generators to generate microwave pulses to send to uh, an experimental system to do quantum computing. Well, what has happened over the last five years is that that has radically changed. And um, in May 2016, we were the first uh, company in the world to build a small quantum computer and make it accessible to the cloud. And you could just sit in front of your computer and write a little program and click run, and it would run on a quantum computer. So basically, it looked like this. You had, uh, you know, you would type your quantum circuit. We would send the zeros and ones over the internet. When it got to the quantum computer we had built in IBM Research, we would convert those uh, zeros and ones into microwave pulses, about five gigahertz. We would send them down a cryostat uh, all the way to uh, the qubits that you see here. That's where we would generate the quantum bits uh, using interference and superposition and entanglement. We would perform the quantum computation. We would get a measurement, the result, amplify the signal back, and return the answer back to the user. So all of that was done transparent to the user. This is what the interior of one of our quantum computers look like. It's a model of it. We use a form of technology called superconducting quantum computers. And uh, incidentally, if I may say, I think they're really beautiful. Uh, what you see you know, typically gets uh, referred to as this golden chandelier. Uh, it is basically the inside of um, the, you know, this chandelier, so to speak, sits inside a dilution refrigerator. And at the very bottom of it, uh, I'll show you a video so we traverse through it. At the very bottom of it is a quantum processor that operates at cryogenic temperature. So it's one of the coldest places of the universe, the bottom of a quantum computer. And um, so here are these, these coaxial cables that you see here, send the microwave pulses down. The mirror-like structure that you see here at the bottom is the quantum processor. That's where the qubits live and uh, where we operate them. And then, you know, at that bottom where that processor was, that operates about 15 millikelvin. So it's about 100 times colder than outer space. 
And you do that because you have to actually, you know, you, you exploit uh, the principle of superconductivity, which, you know, requires uh, these low temperatures, but also you also need to isolate the system enough to exploit the special properties of, of quantum physics. Um, if you sort of dig, you know, underneath this quantum processor, you would find uh, the device that is responsible for making these qubits. And those are depicted on the right hand side. In the end, you would find a nanostructure of 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers that allows us to control and create a very well defined two level system or a ground state and an excited state. And the sort of wiggly lines that you see here in the picture on the right are the coupling resonators that allow us to couple qubits to one another and create this, uh, you know, very extra sophisticated uh, states um, that operate according to the laws of quantum mechanics that allows you to do operations you couldn't do classically. The important thing is that because the technology is coming of age, there's a global community of of scientists and engineers and practitioners who are learning about quantum computing. So this is uh, an animation of uh, all the users that we have made uh, quantum computers available to over the course of the last five to six years, since May 2016. At present, we operate more than 20 quantum computers on the IBM cloud. Cumulatively, this community of over 500,000 users have run 1.6 trillion quantum circuits on actual quantum computers. And you see here this plot of, of users all over the world. And uh, now over 175 institutions, from universities to large companies, to startups, to research laboratories, have joined the IBM Quantum Network to, to work with us and to collaborate and learn about this new way of programming uh, systems to uh, you know, develop intellectual property, develop skills, uh, develop curriculum, and, uh, and explore use cases like the ones that you see on the right-hand side. You know, everything from materials uh, simulation to a novel field called quantum machine learning, uh, which you know, it looks at the intersection of, of the world of AI and quantum and optimization problems, a whole plethora of problems are being explored. And in fact, uh, I would say also that now quantum technologies and quantum computing have made it into sort of the short list of national priorities of governments and, and, um, and, and regions that fund research and development. And, uh, and you see here examples that over the last few years, we've not only you know, built quantum computers that we run out of our New York uh, you know, uh, facilities, but we have now uh, placed a quantum computer in Germany, in the Fraunhofer uh, Institute. Uh, we have also a national partnership in Japan, where we've placed also quantum computers in the University of Tokyo. We've announced, I'll say more about this, given this audience, uh, about the partnership we established with the Cleveland Clinic uh, on this topic. And also I show examples in Korea and Quebec and more to come. So this is becoming a, a sort of a new scientific infrastructure to, uh, to push the limits of, of research. I think perhaps the area that I'm you know, incredibly excited and passionate about is just how a new quantum, a quantum native generation uh, is being trained and is, and is beginning to think about this topic of computation and its implications in a totally different fashion. Through our, um, you know, we've committed, you know, very extensively to provide, you know, not only open access to quantum computers, half of our quantum fleet is open access and free for anybody to go and learn and use. Uh, over 3 million learners have participated in our online courses uh, across 100 plus countries. Um, over 50 research institutions also are developing curriculum using the technology and, uh, and the environment around this. And, um, and we have an incredible partnership also with 23 HBCUs in the United States. Um, and just to give you a flavor of interest, uh, you know, in this every summer we host summer students in IBM research in our quantum program, we typically have about 60 slots or so that, that we fill. And over the last couple of years, we've received over 10,000 applicants, just to give you a sense of just how much interest there is. Ultimately, this will be transparent to a user. You would sit in front of your computer, you will use your favorite programming language, your favorite code. Behind the scenes, there will be libraries of quantum circuits that would get mapped transparently in the cloud to run on quantum computers. Calculation will be run. The answer will be provided back to the user. And all that one would experience is that your computer was able to do something that you couldn't do before, right? But the 
ultimate objective is that one that you would not need to know. Quantum physics, right? Uh, the details of quantum computing, you just get to benefit from quantum computers on the cloud. So what is to come, right? So you've seen all the progress over the last, you know, uh, the last decade. We released a roadmap last year. Uh, in uh, uh, November of last year, we announced we were the you know, first institution ever to build a, a quantum processor with more than 100 qubits. So this is uh, called Eagle, it has 127 qubits. This year, we will build a 433 qubit system. In 2023, we will build a system with over a thousand qubits. And then, you know, following that, there'll be a system with many thousands and tens of thousands of qubits. Importantly, there's a whole new software stack and libraries that is being built on top that will allow for applications um, ranging from optimization, the natural sciences, finance, machine learning, to be able to be incorporated into those fields. In a way, much a kind like what you would be familiar that over the last decade, AI has permeated a lot of our scientific disciplines. You know, we anticipate that uh, you know quantum will do something similar. This is um, uh, a rendering of the 127 qubit system, the, the very first uh, quantum processor to break the 100 qubit barrier. What is fascinating is now we have like we have a 3D system, right? Where you have the qubits and the interconnect of all the qubits go through multi-layer wiring, uh, just like you do in classical semiconductors, except in this case, it needs to be all superconducting. So it's a real tour de force in terms of material science. And then lastly, I'll show you uh, a vision of where we're going in terms of you have seen um, the advent of supercomputers. You've seen the advent of AI-centric supercomputers. And this is um, you know, a vision that we're gonna make a reality of creating quantum centric supercomputers. So you're seeing here our quantum system two uh, that we're designing and building. And in this case is a vision of a quantum data center. Each one of those hexagonal centers is a quantum computer that will have you know, between 400 and a few thousand qubits. Surrounding around it is classical computers that allow you to control the quantum computer. And you see here that you're seeing a large collection of quantum computers that will be first connected to one another through classical computers. And in the future, they will be connected with quantum links. And that will be the beginning of a whole other field called a quantum intranet and the quantum internet that would allow one to have secure communications between quantum nodes that are protected from the law with, uh, with the laws of physics from eavesdropping, right? So, so you're seeing here like, you know, a whole new generation of, of computing um, that is gonna radically alter possibilities of how we do discovery in science. So to close, in fact, the story of computing for the coming decade is not just a story of quantum. I like to say that the future of computing is bits plus neurons plus qubits. And what I mean by that is bits, the world of high precision computation, Think about it as like the calculator-like functions. Neurons as embodiment of neural networks and the world of AI where you learn by example. And qubits that obeys the laws of quantum physics to simulate uh, models of the world that uh, obey the laws of quantum. And the most profound implication of this whole story is that it is not about the implications of each one of those technologies as important as they are, but rather, what the world would look like through their convergence. When we bring together bits, neurons, and qubits, integrated into a hybrid cloud environment and assisted by AI to mask the complexity of the system. And there's nothing I'm more excited about than bringing all of this together in the context of doing science and scientific discovery. And this is the, um, to, to um, give the, uh, the example I promised, is the partnership we've launched with the Cleveland Clinic it's uh, gonna be a decade long partnership to bring these ideas together, high performance computing, AI and quantum and skills and education in the context of the new global pathogen center that they have launched. And as part of that, we, will, we are already designing and building the first quantum computers that we will deploy in the state of Ohio. And there's gonna be a very active research program and educational program to uh, explore the implications of this technology to the world of the life sciences and, and to healthcare. And we just could not be more excited uh, uh, 
uh, about this partnership with, with our friends at the Cleveland Clinic, and then you know the implications that it will have more broadly to the community. So thank you. Let me stop there and um, take any questions. Well, you know, I've listened to you talk about this. I've been online and seen your presentations, but hearing it in real time, it's just breathtaking. It's absolutely breathtaking. You know, what a testament to human knowledge, my gosh. Um, so uh, I'm gonna kick off with a couple of questions while um, Anna pulls together our audience questions. Um, so um, Dario, you, you did talk at the very end about the relationship between quantum computing and machine learning. Where does artificial intelligence fit into that? Right, yeah. So, so what is important I think to understand is that when we have data, right? It could be laboratory data, it could be field evidence data. The transformation of what the raw data looks like, the signals that come in, into a new representation that allows us to find structure in that data is at the core of what AI does and the core about what quantum does. So even though the representations are very different, the general gist of our intuition to be able to share with all of you is you take the raw input and you map it to a, a new way to represent that information that allows you to see patterns in distinct new ways. So in machine learning, you do that with large scale neural networks, right? Where it is the process of training the network by example that allows you to learn structure that uh, about something about the world that looks very different than the symbolic manipulation that we would do when we have a closed form equation or where we have a closed form representation that is diagrammatic. In quantum, it's similar, but like you're, you're sort of doing the mapping in a totally different way. Now, what is also interesting is that now there's a feel of connecting these two worlds and you're saying, how does the quantum representation of structure in the world allow me to do classification and things that typically I do in machine learning? So that's one direction. How does quantum help AI? But then there's also the other direction is how does AI help quantum? And we use AI too in the characterization of the quantum processors and ultimately in the calculations themselves as I was alluding to, quantum will only solve some problems. It will be a small group of problems that are very hard or impossible to solve. But the majority of a calculation, if I think about 10 years from now, I would say we will do a lot of like the normal mathematical calculations. We will do a lot of AI and we will do some quantum, but that quantum will be the difference between possible and impossible. So it'll be very valuable, but it's not like the future is not just quantum or just AI. It's, it's combining all of these things. Okay, great. Thank you. I, that's a helpful context. I'm going to throw out one more question, and, and I know the audience questions are starting to come in, and Anna will take care of those. Um, but precision medicine seems like a field that could benefit from quantum because of the number of variables, uh, you know, in terms of diagnosing and treating cancer and what, what we know about uh, genetic information. Um, have you had experience or are you exploring that with Cleveland or other places um, using quantum and in, in precision medicine? Yeah, so I think ultimately can have a difference, but it is, um, I think we're gonna have to go in stages of complexity. So the beginning we are gonna start in terms of quantum, just given how nascent the technology is, starting with things like small molecules and you know, a small level of interactions. And as you grow in the level of complexity through the scale of like larger molecules, let alone like, you know, living systems, you know, much larger scale and the interaction of those systems, the degree of complexity grows, right? I mean, I, it is correct that it is, you know, an exponential problem, but I see that as a longer term uh, effort compared to the reality of where quantum is today. So that's where, I think what is important is to continue to use the techniques we have computation available, namely, of course, you know, the world of bits and neurons that I was talking about, and then sort of like start maturing in the complexity curve of the life sciences and ultimately leading with large interactions as quantum computing uh, matures. But we got to start that. I think that that's too hard a problem 
to uh, you know formulate it to the current stage? Well, it's good to know that quantum can't solve every single problem now, right? So that oh, for sure, you, that's for you, sure. <laughs> you still have some challenges ahead of you to work out. Um, Anna, I think we we we're starting to get a bunch of questions yes. from the audience. Yes, we are. So Daria, one question that's come in. Can you say a bit more about the potential convergence of quantum and neuromorphic computing? And what areas of research do you think are particularly ripe for harnessing those leaps in computation to advance the pace of discovery? Yeah, so neuromorphic. So what is it? It's a you know, fa fancy word for uh, the, you know, trying to build systems that are more, much more natively attuned to the implementation of neural architectures and neural networks. So the first wave of neural networks, we did something very simple, right? You had neurons, right? One to another, they were connected in layers where each neuron talked to every other neuron in the layer above. And the neurons did something very simple, it either activated or it didn't activate. And the connection between the neurons is what's called as the weight associated with uh, with those neurons. And the, when we say that in machine learning, you learn, by example, what we're trying to do is to learn the weights associated with recognizing, for example, objects in the world. So that was implemented first with classical, com with normal computers, right, in a CPU. Then in the last decade, we've seen the mapping of those neural networks to something a little bit more specialized called GPUs, you know, graphical processing units. So these are more you know, specialized to do the mathematic operations in neural networks. And the next evolution of that is to actually implement much more natively the structure of the neuron itself, where the memory and the compute, it is present in the device. Neuromorphic goes even one step further and basically says, let me mimic much more closely what is our current understanding of a biological neuron and see whether that allows us to compute with better power performance compared to a more sort of like, you know, simplified neuron. The downside of it is that the algorithms we have developed to do neuromorphic computing do not work as well as the ones where we have a simplified representation of the neurons, right? The world of deep learning. So, so it's very promising area of research, but it yet has to demonstrate that you can outperform these more synthetic neural networks in terms of accuracy. But we know that there's something dissatisfying with the neural networks so far because they're very computationally expensive. Like if you look at us, we dissipate 20 watts, right? And we're capable of incredible feats, right? Of intelligence. And you see these other machines that do like pretty fancy things, but they consume orders of magnitude more energy to do a fraction of what we do. So there's something that like we know we're doing wrong and the neuromorphic direction is an attempt to sort of get closer to the biological inspiration that we know is capable of computing with a totally different level of energy. Wow, that's fascinating, thank you. Um, so another question that's come in, what research is most needed to scale up quantum computing? Is it nanoscale materials, higher T superconductivity or something else? A lot of areas. <laughs> well, as Jenny was saying, we, we, we do not lack problems to solve. So everything from materials, uh, you know, so today, like the interfaces that we make the superconducting justice of junction are the junctions of aluminum and aluminum oxide. So it's uh, the material science, the deposition around that, the device uh, engineering itself, the packaging of the chips, the control electronics, how we send the signal down, just to give you a flavor, you know, inside one of these cryostats, if the energy of one one thousand of a photon goes into the cryostats in an uncontrolled fashion, it's enough to be able to make the system decohere, right? So like how you do sh the shielding, the cryogenics, the electronics, and then the entire algorithmic area. How do you do error correction? One of the most difficult problems in quantum computing is that, um, like all computers, but these ones in particular, they have errors, right? So external energy from the world couples into my qubits. And when the external energy from the world couples to it, it messes them up and it can induce errors. So correcting for errors is a very, very hard problem. And just to you know, give a sense of an, a tricky problem with it, 
if people have heard about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or at least in quantum mechanics, is this idea that the act of observation alters the state. So if you are computing in the quantum computer and you say, hey, computer, have you made an error here, right? Have you, you know, uh, flipped a bit? The act of making that question, the act of putting energy to answer that question destroys the state. So there's actually an enormous uh, level of theoretical uh, sophistication to figure out how do you ask that question without revealing the state? So, so you have to look, my joke is you have to look, but not too carefully. And, uh, and in doing that, you are able to actually do error mitigation and correction. Got it, thank you. Jenny? Yeah, and um, Dario, I think we're at 2.30, but there's so many questions coming in and this is a lot to take in. So uh, I hear you have a few extra minutes and we're gonna, we're gonna use those. Um, so um, question about um, the energy use. So mm -hmm. is there a parallel R&D effort underway at IBM to address the energy consumption in future computing in cloud storage, uh, et cetera? Yeah, great question. I just participated in a seminar last week uh, at MIT that MIT organized and they invited Jeff Dean, who has my kind of equivalent position at Google, and I participated. And we actually had a wonderful debate on this very topic just the sustainability and energy of computing. So I, AI would encourage you to look that up and, uh, and look at it. But yes, the answer is like, it's actually one of the hottest and most interesting areas of computing is how to address it. And it goes from everything from how do we have more specialized computing? One answer is instead of having very generic computing that is like somewhat efficient at many tasks, have very specialized computing by task. If you're trying to do transaction processing, do a very specialized machine. If you store data, a very interesting example that we, uh, we discussed was, hey, you know, we have all these pictures of our photos, let's say, right? And, uh, and you know, maybe it could be medical records of images and so on. Not all photos need to be, uh, need to be uh, queried, you know, in a millisecond at all times, right? You could have things like, hey, I don't need it. When I need it, I look it up. If you store all that information with hard disk drives, it's extraordinarily expensive and energy intensive you could store the majority of that information in tape and retrieve it when you need it, as an example. But to bring it back to quantum, we build supercomputers, right? And we pull them in national laboratories to do calculations that involve, let's say the world of chemistry, right? And, and just to give you sort of ballpark numbers, the energy consumption of a supercomputer is in the megawatt regime. So tens of megawatts ballpark okay quantum it's in the tens of kilowatts so there's a factor of 1000 different in terms of energy consumption so if we can continue to progress quantum computing to do calculations that you could only do with supercomputers the gain there is on factors of a thousand plus so that's a really powerful direction around that but it's back to the subset of specialization is key the future of computing is specialization in terms of workloads. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jenny, may I ask another audience question? Yeah. Great. Uh, Dario, one question that's come in, can you speak to the amount of training uh, of the system as compared to what's required for the implementation of AI? I think this person is getting at AI versus quantum. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, so, so that applies more to the world of AI, right? So, so in AI, indeed, the, the way the thing works, I mean, in general, neural networks in the last decade of deep learning is, is you, you collect, uh, you know, data examples of things you want to train the machine in. You take a subset of the total data that you have and you use that to train the neural network. And then you use the remainder of the data to verify that what you have learned in the training set applies to the broader data set that you have available. So a big vector in AI has been, how do I uh, figure out? I mean, one, one direction is how do I use more training, more, I mean, more data to train bigger, bigger system. But another direction is how do I learn from less? How do I learn with less examples? Because the majority of the cost of an AI project is the data labeling, the data training, the data preparation. It's like 90% of the cost of doing an AI project. So one of the most exciting directions in AI in the last couple of years 
is this thought of self-supervision at scale. And that is drastically reducing the amount of labeling that is required to get a large scale neural network to train itself. Mm -hmm. And it trains itself by the equivalent of playing games. And, um, and, and through that, you can have less labels. In quantum, when we're using it for simulating molecules and so on, the paradigm is not training, but rather calculation, right? Rather, you create this state, you know, this Hamiltonian to be very precise, and you evolve sort of this state in such a way that it mimics the physical system that you're trying to model. So you're not training, but you're rather replicating something that is a physical system and you're evolving it in the quantum computer in directions that you care about. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to ask one more and then we're going to let you go. Uh, we have a quick announcement, but um, so you and, and IBM and many others have been very active in the CHIPS Act and trying to address the chip shortage in the U.S. Quantum computing, more or less chips, not chips. Um, are there other components that we, we need to be concerned that we make sure we have access to um, over the long term? Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up chips <laughs> because it's one of the most important problems we have to address, right? In the science and technology world, uh, we've ended up in a really tough spot, right? As a society in which we make, we don't manufacture any of the advanced chips that are required to run our economies in the United States or, you know, for that matter, in, in Europe or Japan and so on. So we need to course correct that. And there's legislation going on to inject sort of historical levels of funding to course correct that situation, right? So, but the question you ask is, do, do quantum computers use chips, right? So one of the reasons we chose superconducting processors is because we get to leverage a lot of the expertise we have built over many decades on semiconductor technology. We get to you reuse the substrates, right? Um, we get to reuse uh, the planar process, the fabrication mechanisms, packaging. You have to adapt it. The device is not the same. The materials are not the same. But a lot of the know-how and technology that we have built over many decades get to be exploited in the creation of the quantum processors. There's a lot of other devices also that make up a system. And part of that is relies on chips, right? The control electronics. And, uh, and, and over time also, there'll be semiconductors that go inside the cryostat, inside the quantum computer sort of uh, pillar itself that have to work at very low temperatures, and that's going to rely on chips as well. So short answer to your question is yes, it does rely and uses semiconductor, I mean, you know, semiconductor and fabrication technologies. Well, our time with you has come to an end. This has been so fascinating, and your the energy that you bring to this is just infectious. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. It's my really pleasure. appreciate it. Um, and so next week, um, we're taking a break from our Alliance member meetings because we're hosting an event. And if you heard, haven't heard about it yet, well, that you're just not watching your email. Um, it's the 2022 Advocacy Awards. We've got an incredible lineup of honorees and a who's who of guest speakers. It will be inspiring and enlightening, and you won't want to miss it. So the awards are happening next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you haven't registered yet, I hope you will. Uh, it's free. And here's a link in the chat for you to do so. Um, as I said, it's free, but it does require you to register ahead of time. So we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, a round of applause, uh, virtual applause uh, for Dario. Thanks so much.